to welcome you to the John Ramsden Memorial Lecture uh, to be given this evening by the Right Honourable David Willits. I'm delighted in particular that John's um, widow is able to join us this evening for this, this celebratory lecture. The lecture does indeed celebrate the life and work of John Ramsden, who was a member of this university for 38 years until his retirement in 2008. And during that time, John made major contributions as an eminent historian, notably of the Conservative Party. In a moment, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Professor Lord Peter Hennessy to say a few words about John Ramsden, and it will then be my privilege to introduce David Willits. After the lecture, Peter will chair a question and answer session, which uh, David has uh, kindly agreed to, to engage in. And after that, it will be my pleasure to invite you all to uh, join in the reception, the drinks reception, in the foyer of the Queen's Building. But first of all, Peter, I invite you to say a few words. Hello. We're in trouble already. <laughs> Not entirely. It's a great pleasure and an honour to. I'll turn it off. John would have enjoyed this. He, he knew about my gifts for technology. <laughs> Just to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> Our sponsor, Hewlett Packard, is extraordinary, really. They're very generous to us. <laughs> and yet they have in me somebody that causes equipment to crash. John was very special to very many of us in this room. There's hardly a day goes by when I don't think of him because of the friendship. He was an extraordinary friend to me for many years, which was intensified when I came here in 1992. But I always miss him particularly at the moments when I needed his wisdom. A year ago, this evening I think the coalition was formed, it was a year ago this very Tuesday evening. And for five days I had to impersonate the British Constitution in various <laughs> television studios because the Queen can't come on and say what her role is and that isn't. isn't, isn't. And John and I used to talk about that. It's about far back as 1974, He'd been AJP Taylor's, uh, David Butler's research assistant in the results program for the BBC when it was unexpectedly calm, and uh, had to, in the small hours of the night, cull all the sources on hung parliaments and what the constitution was, so that whichever dimble boy it was that was doing it on that particular occasion <laughs> wasn't in the soup. And so John and I used to talk about these contingencies. He thought, yeah, I think he thought I rather overdid it. It was the train spotter of me that he. He was quite funny about that sometimes. But I do wish he was here this week at a moment of immense political fluidity. Because not only did he have this uncanny ability to predict the outcome of elections of all kinds, he could actually sort the particles as they fly at us. John could sort of do kaleidoscopic things with them. And the wisdom of John Ramsden was very special. He was the rock of our history department from, was it 1974? So a long time, right through to his retirement. And I'm not the only one who thinks about him a great deal of the time. But he would have loved the fact that the first lecture in his memory is David. He did David one great service, I think, if I remember rightly. He suggested that one of our students, the pearl amongst our students, Nick Hillman, who's here, here this evening, um, should become David's special advisor. I know you've a bit to go in politics, but you won't make a decision as good as that one again, at least not for a few years. And John was instrumental in that, and also had a rolling conversation with David, as he, as he did with several leading Conservatives, about the nature of Conservatism. And so, you miss him for different reasons, but I'm sure just as profoundly as so many of uh, of us do. So David, it's a great treat to have you with us, and on a theme he would have relished, Liberal Conservatism. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Peter. It's a great pleasure to be here. When you say you're impersonating the British Constitution, Peter, you are the British Constitution. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and indeed, as we have occasionally those fraught debates about whether Britain needs a written constitution, or at least a constitution written down in one single place, I always personally think that the best way forward is what I call the Erskine May solution of we write a guidebook to the British Constitution that gradually over time becomes the British Constitution 
And I can think of no better author of this guidebook than you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, so you could read the British Constitution, what Erskine May was to have parliamentary proceeding. Peter, you, of course, have made your own uh, excellent, uh, enormous contribution to the understanding of government and politics. Uh, but today we are uh, celebrating someone in John Ramsden who also made a really quite extraordinary contribution. And it's a great honour for me personally to be here to give this inaugural Ramsden lecture. It is the sheer quality and quantity of his work that makes him the preeminent historian of conservatism in his generation. Now I recognise that John had many, uh, a wide range of interests. People talk about his interest in film. They talk about his responsibilities that he discharged to Queen Mary's. I knew him through him, knew him personally and also through his writings above all because of his extraordinary wisdom about conservatism and the conservative party. So that's what I'm going to touch on this evening but I didn't want to go without, part, without mentioning these other aspects of his life. I certainly shamelessly drew on John's writings in my own accounts of conservatism, notably a long pamphlet for the Centre for Policy Studies uh, entitled After the Landslide, which drew on studies of the landslides of 1906 and 1945 to warn my party of the mistakes that we were making after 1997. I felt like one of those Soviet writers who wanted to write about Stalin but ended up producing long books on Ivan the Terrible, hoping people would kind of notice the parallel. Um, and my pamphlet was essentially a very long cry, can't you see we're doing a 1906 when we should be doing a 1945? Um, John was, of course, a proper historian, and he would have always been wary of such political uses of history. Nevertheless, he left such a rich body of work that made lay people like myself were always trawling it for the lessons of history. John was always very tolerant of our amateurish attempts to learn from it. Perhaps he was thinking of A.J.P. Taylor's remark that Napoleon III learned from the mistakes of the past so as to make entirely new ones in the future. <laughs> Uh, my personal debt to John goes even deeper, and Peter's already mentioned this. My special advisor, Nick Hillman, who has worked for me off and on for the last 10 years. John wrote to me in 1999, recommending a young academic in the QMC history department, Nick Hillman, to be my researcher. He also urged Nick to uh, apply to uh, Conservative Central Office. I'm not sure that all this quite passes the Clegg test, but it has worked out fantastically, and now Nick is my special advisor in biz. And we both believe that you cannot understand the policy issue unless you know its history. And we do try to approach issues like the new white paper that we're writing on higher education at the moment by studying very carefully, and Nick and I compare notes, what we've found from reading Robbins or reading Deering, discovering so many policy issues coming round that they had wrestled with before me. Only indeed last week we invited a group of historians of higher education into this to discuss all this, and if I had my way we would once more have historians inside Whitehall departments. Now, John was quite simply the best historian of conservatism of his generation. It's obviously a personal tragedy that he, she, he should have died at the age of 62 should so soon after entering retirement. But he did leave behind an extraordinarily rich body of work. His first book, The Making of Conservative Policy, is a minor classic, even if not a light read. I must confess to having read it myself from cover to cover. I found it gripping. I recommend it to others, rather like Lady Bracknell advising Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee, you may admit, it is somewhat too sensational. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I enjoyed the book. And then there comes the magisterial Longman history of conservatism, which he pretty much rescued single-handed, writing the great final three volumes, The Age of Balfour and Baldwin, The Age of Churchill and Eden, and The Winds of Change, Macmillan to Heath. Uh, they have made, they are an enormous advance in our understanding. <coughs> Conservative history. It is a scandal that they were only available in hardback and then at a very high price. 
I still look forward to the day when they are more widely accessible in paperback, which is what they deserve to be. Uh, I said that John was preeminent, but let me just explain that. The previous generation of historians uh, of, conservative, of conservatism was represented by Robert Blake with his great biography of Disraeli and his history of the Conservative Party, and they're both excellent books. But Robert Blake's account of conservative history is very parliamentary, and I think now it has been worn smooth by overuse. So I don't think, uh, and Robert was simply not able to uh, draw on the extraordinary range of research that was available for John. There is a rival claim from another group of historians to preeminence, from the Cambridge School of High Tory writers and historians, notably Morris Cowan. And here I'm going to follow that wise piece of advice for a politician, Peter will remember it, there was a uh, there was an um, American politician who was uh, being criticised for negative campaigning. And he said, you might not like negative campaigning, but at least it's honest. <laughs> and um, so I'm now going to engage in a spot of negative campaigning, because it seems to me clear that John Ramsden stands head and shoulders above that Cambridge school represented by Morris Cowan. I still remember struggling through Maurice Cowling's book, uh, 1867, on the passage of the Second Reform Act. And my main memory of that book was simply how hard it was to read. Uh, and of course, actually, Maurice Cowling was a journalist. He could write well if he wished, but it seems as if he didn't want to make it easy to follow. And I eventually concluded that this was deliberate. If politics is to be a game played by the elite, it should only be understood by the elite. That Cambridge Peterhouse view of conservatism as a political intrigues of an elite was reflected in a pro style that erected defensive ramparts around ideas not to be shared with the multitude. It's only one step towards that dreadful postmodern view of politics where narratives are invented and where nothing is real. You go from the Namia denouncing ideas as mere flat doodle to the rise of the narrative and the spin doctors who convey it. And you end up with an account of politics as just a game played for position. Now, of course, we mustn't be prissy about our motives. Of course, we all, uh, we all have uh, our own failings and foibles and low, and low motives. But that kind of account of politics, who's up, who's down, who's in, who's out, who's trying to get on, just omits far too much. Peter O'Born has tracked as brilliantly as, ever, as anyone has the nihilistic consequences of this intellectual fashion. John Ramsden took a very different approach. He, his approach was also a far better one. His books for Longman are the first serious history of conservatism that connects parliamentary and political activity at the top with evidence about the party across the country and wider economic and social changes. And of course, one reason he was able to do this was because he himself was a conservative activist serving for a time as a councillor. His historical understanding was enriched by personal experience. And let me select some of the things I have learnt from his historical writing, which to me, helped me make sense of uh, the liberal conservatism I'm talking about this evening. I think, for example, he showed the way that Baldwin managed the media skillfully and made the Conservative Party the National Party. It was Baldwin who was the first person who took Disraeli's references to two nations and said instead the Conservative, should be the, part, the Conservative Party should be the party of one nation. He put the Conservative Party at the centre of the nation's life and managed to uh, condemn uh, Labour and indeed Liberals out to the margins. And what John Brilliantly did in his writing was trace the roots of the reconstruction of conservatism after 1945 to some of those Baldwinian insights. Then, secondly, he was also one of the crucial figures in demolishing that conventional wisdom of a Butzkerite consensus, where it's striking the insights that he developed as a political historian are so similar 
to the insights of Robert Skidelsky in his work as an economic historian on Keynes. Because what John got us to do was to look at post-1945 economic policy very differently. He said there was a, a pre-Keynesian belief in controlling the economy through microeconomic controls, which carried on into the Labour Party as late as 1950, and Harold Wilson at the Board of Trade, we now know, circulating papers to Cabinet about the long-term future of price controls. And by contrast, Keynesianism then, being a policy which enabled governments to disengage from microcontrols and instead take a responsibility for macroeconomic management. And he places the Conservative Party clearly ahead of the micro-interventionists and makes it clear that the that intellectual debate carried on through the late 40s and early 50s. And the paradox, and even now, <coughs> it's not um, Keynesian, but the understanding of the responsibility of government for macro policy dis uh, uh, discharges as much through monetary policy as fiscal policy. Even that goes hand in hand with a belief in enterprise and the free market economy, expressions which John traced back to those uh, conservative tracts and CPC pamphlets and all those documents he studied so carefully that appeared um, post-1945. He also helped me, the third item on my list, he helped me understand something about the character of conservatism in the late 40s and 50s that carried on into the later history of the party. Uh, we're all familiar with that notorious Douglas J quote, the man in white hall knows best. But I want to read the full quote with the previous sentence, which I think contains the clue to a lot of the Conservative Party's post-war history. What he actually said was, housewives as a whole cannot be trusted to buy the right things. The gentleman in Whitehall really does know better what is good for the people than the people themselves. By the way, that is not me, that's Douglas Jones. <laughs> Clear? What he was, in other words, the contrast was a male-female contrast, and it was also a consumer-producer contrast. The people who are standing in the queues waiting to get the goods and services that were still being rationed into the late 40s and beyond were by and large women. They were on the receiving end of, macroeconomic, uh, of economic controls. And, the, and it was the housewives' alliance, it was speaking up for women as consumers that helped give the Conservative Party a lot of its uh, energy and purpose in the uh, late 40s, uh, early 50s. And indeed, it's, an, it's interesting to have an assessment of that of the Conservative Manifesto in, Feb, in 1950 from the youngest Conservative candidate who fought in that election. Let me quote, very heavy public spending had kept the standard rate of income tax almost at wartime levels, nine shillings in the pound. Far from being dismantled, wartime controls had, if anything, been extended. For example, rationing was extended to bread in 1946 and even potatoes a year later. It was therefore possible to fight the 1950 election campaign on precisely the kind of issues which are most dangerous for a sitting government, and ones with which I personally felt most at ease. That is a combination of high ideological themes with more down-to-earth, bread-and-butter matters. The 1950 Conservative Manifesto was a cleverly crafted document which combined a devastating indictment of socialism in theory and in practice with a prudent list of specific pledges to reverse it. That is Margaret Thatcher describing the Conservative election campaign of 1950 and the focus on the consumer and the focus on the on domestic economy and the, ar and the arguments and narratives that we became so familiar with in the 1970s and 80s can be traced right back to those formative experiences in the late 40s and early 50s. And of course every leader of the party then uh, wants to distance themselves from that history but re reintegrating the early Margaret Thatcher and her experiences with the subsequent, what was subsequently known as Hatchism, is another one of the, I think, historical achievements that, to which, uh, for which we are deeply indebted to John Ramsey. He gave uh, a bold interpretation of Heath, interpreting Edward Heath's policies and essentially as an early attempt at modernisation of Britain, an abortive attempt, but nevertheless an attempt at modernisation. And he put 
urban Toryism centre stage. One of the many challenges facing our party is that when we talk about community, something that's fundamental to uh, liberal conservatism, when we talk about community, it's easy to define and think of communities in, in a rural environment. A community is the point when the street lights stop and the blackness of the countryside begins. Now, for me, as someone brought up in Birmingham, like John, very much an urban Tory, I've always felt rather uncomfortable when in the night you look, pull back the curtains and see it's all black out there, there aren't those comforting rows of sodium lamps and cars whizzing up and down. And John understood that a modern conservative understanding of community cannot be defined by the boundaries of a small village or community with fields beyond. He understood that it uh, had to be placed in an urban setting where the vast majority of voters and of conservatives live. Something else that I think he's helped bring centre stage. Um, and above all, uh, the final item on my list is that he proved, uh, I think as clearly as anyone can in history, that the only reason that we have a Conservative Party today, the world's most long-lived and successful democratic political party, is precisely because of previous generations of modernizers. Modernizing, in other words, is not a betrayal of conservatism, it is the only reason that the Conservative Party has survived and traced those debates going on through the Conservative Party generation after generation. So those are a set of insights that I've drawn from John's writings, which I think are very relevant for our political discussions today. What happened then was he distilled all this in his great single volume history, An Appetite for Power. And uh, let me uh, make, uh, and of course in his, in his book, in the pursuit of the argument about the Conservative Party's Appetite for Power, he traced the different, the, the movements of the tectonic plates as the party shifted its position on key issues. And let's face it, there have been many such shifts across our history, from opposition to free trade to acceptance of free trade, from opposition to parliamentary reform in the, in the mid-19th century to then leading it in 1867 uh, and afterwards, from a time when we embraced the state, when we were the party of the state, uh, followed by corporatism, followed by pre free market economics. Advocacy of means testing as, an, as a way of ensuring that rich people are not able to benefit from the welfare state towards wariness about the pernicious uh, corrosive effects of means testing towards uh, another recognition that it's a necessary part of any modern welfare state. A belief in the gold standard, leading in turn to fixed exchange rates. So that debate, that vote on Bretton Woods post-1945 was, I think, the vote in the Attlee Commons, which, in which the Conservative Party was in the most deeply split, so <coughs> three ways between people who abstained, people who believed in Bretton Woods and the discipline of fixed exchange rates, and people who opposed it as uh, enslaving the pound to the dollar. But going from a belief in uh, support for Bretton Woods, followed by no financial rule, followed by a domestic monetary rule outside any fixed exchange rate system. So he traced a series of big shifts in Conservative Party thinking. And of course, therefore, invites the question, can, what do we find uh, that connects the Conservative Party through all these historic experiences other than an appetite for power? And let me confess, I don't much like the title, Appetite for Power. It's a great book, but I don't like the title. Um, and I don't like the title because, of course, I mean, of course, as a practicing politician myself, uh, of course uh, we want any politician that he's in politics in order to, he hopes, take some role in the nation's affairs and to take power for his party. And at least John's book isn't entitled The Hunger for Power. Um, and uh, it's a basic fact of political motivation that uh, the uh, parties seek to be in government and in office. And I guess that's particularly true of the Conservative Party. I think back to an exchange arising as a new MP in the House of Commons in 1992 with the then Deputy Chief Whip, David Heathcote Amory, who lost his seat at the last election, briefing the new MPs. And I can still remember his saying, when you are um, uh, thinking to intervene in the Prime Minister's questions, and you wish to put a question to the Prime Minister, you should remember 
the advice that W.G. Grace uh, gave uh, to a bowler when Grace was batting. It was a rather flashy bowler who was uh, up to all manner of hijinks. And at the end of an over, Grace took him aside and said, the spectators are here to watch me bat, not to watch you bowl. <laughs> and this was the advice we were given on our approach to Prime Minister's questions. Um, and I guess it's kind of true of conservatism as a whole that by and large we think that it's better if we're occupying the crease, crease rather than outdoing the bowling. We think that by and large that's where conservatives belong. That isn't too traditional a way of putting it. And of course, there's nothing wrong with an appetite for violence. Uh, for power, provided it's discharged within a strong, robust, legal, liberal framework, uh, and increasingly the very fact of pursuing power and practicing democracy usually pushes you in the right direction. Indeed, it leads you naturally to offset whatever might be the particular eccentricities or obsessions of your party that are pulling you away from the center of gravity of the nation. So indeed, conservatives can become the great flywheel of the Constitution, balancing, stabilizing, offsetting. But it does leave the question, is there anything more to conservatism than that? Well, uh, the Duke of Wellington famously thought not. Let me quote him. He spoke for millions of voters over the years. We hear a great deal of Whig principles and Tory principles and Liberal principles and Mr. Canning's principles. But I confess that I've never seen a definite account of any of them and cannot make myself a clear idea of what any of them mean. Uh, so that's one kind of uh, way of dismissing all this. But for me, I think the deeper truth is captured by T.S. Eliot in an essay distinguishing between what he called the organic and mechanical models of politics. And let me quote T.S. Eliot um, uh, uh, at some length, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs, but it gets to the heart of what I think is, helps us to understand conservatism. And he said the following, political thinking, that is thinking that concerns itself with the permanent principles, if any, underlying party name, can follow two contrasted lines of development. At the beginning, maybe a body of doctrine, perhaps a canonical work, and a band of devoted people set out to disseminate and popularize this doctrine through its emotional appeal the interested and the disinterested, and then as a political party, endeavour to realise a programme based on the doctrine. Before arriving at the position of government, they have envisaged some final state of society of which their doctrines give the outline. The theory has altogether preceded the practice. But political ideas may come into being by an opposite process. A political party may find that it has had a history before it is fully aware of or agreed upon its own permanent tenets. It may have arrived at its actual formulation through a succession of metamorphoses and adaptations during which some issues have been superannuated and new issues have arisen. What, is, what its fundamental tenets are will probably be found only by careful examination of its behaviour throughout its history and by examination of what its more thoughtful and philosophic minds have said on its behalf. And only accurate historical knowledge and judicious analysis will be able to discriminate between the permanent and the transitory between those doctrines and principles which it must ever and in all circumstances maintain or manifest itself, manifest itself fraud, and those called forth by special circumstances which are only intelligible and justifiable in the light of those circumstances. End of quote. So that's the T.S. Eliot kind of organic account of the origin of the development of <coughs> political philosophy, and I think it absolutely captures the Conservative Party. And what it does mean, and some of our shrewdest uh, critics, and it's to be found in uh, some of the 19th century writing, but um, it perhaps came out most vividly uh, uh, post the war in two great uh, quotations. One from Harold Macmillan uh, in his new introduction to the Middle Way. Of course, it first came out in 1938, rather a corporatist tract. In 1958, came out with a rather different, avid introduction. Our Tory party, he said, which stressed the claims of authority, the need for the state to protect the weak, in the 19th century, and which champions the claims of liberty in the 20th century, has not changed its ground. It is occupying the same ground, the middle ground. It is only the direction of the attack which is altered. So the argument is, you are defined by the people against whom you find yourselves debating, and you are the, uh, the voice that um, recognised 
uh, in the 19th century, and I think in Clinton also great expression, um, uh, economic liberalism is very nearly true. And then in the 20th century, it finds itself with a different kind. And in fact, Hogg himself puts it uh, very well in his great book. In fighting socialism in the 20th, as they thought, liberalism in the 19th century, conservatives will be found to have changed their front to meet a new danger, but not the ground they are defending. Um, and let me uh, state what I think that ground is. And for me, there are two principles battling, battling to some extent in contention with each other in liberal conservatism. One, the liberal bit, if you like, is a principle of freedom, choice, individuality, self-determination. It's about the individual and it's all the excitement and dynamism of a modern market economy and participating in it as a consumer. But there's something else. And the second principle is belonging, commitment, uh, giving yourself to something bigger than you are, loyalty, habit, commitment to uh, commitment as being a good thing in its own right. That second principle you might call the more Tory principle of the two. And it's that combination of those two principles which makes con liberal conservatism well suited to adapt as it responds to the particular pressures facing a society at any given moment in time. Now, it would be neat to go on and to describe these two principles, and lots of people do, the freedom and the belonging as the twin poles of British politics. But actually, I don't think that quite works. I think that attempt at classifying our political parties leads to confusion. Because equally, Labour politicians could claim uh, connections with both those strands. And indeed, I think they're both instincts within each one of us as we go through life. I think that the difference between the political parties is the different ways in which they combine those two principles. In other words, comparing political parties is more like, so the commissaire is saying, I'm certainly not, comparing whiskies or coffees. It's the blending that counts. It's who's got the better way of combining these two deep human aspirations. And I would argue that uh, one of the uh, problems with the uh, Labour, previous Labour government's approach, was that its approach to the constitution and national identity um, was too thin and contractual, didn't understand the powers of belonging, and sometimes its approach to the economy was too thick and associational and didn't properly understand the importance of freedom and mobility in a market economy. So in other words, it's the blend that matters. And I believe that there is a distinctive liberal conservative blend. And at the heart of that blend is a belief in institutions, as a place where those aspirations, personal aspirations, and commitments to something bigger than oneself are played out. And of course, uh, John himself embodied this with his commitment and his long career to this institution, to Queen Mary's College, and it is great to see it flourishing today. It's something that I try to put at the heart of conservatism um, in my book, um, Civic Conservatism. And I believe, as we now look forward to the future of conservative thought, drawing, and I become increasingly interested in these over the past few years, drawing on some of the new insights emerging from game theory, from uh, evolutionary uh, biology, from psychology, we will understand increasingly the crucial role of the institution in shaping habits and providing an environment in which individualistic behaviour becomes cooperative. Uh, that's the insight about the evolution of cooperation, and that's, and although it's a subject for a separate lecture, it's the solution to the prisoner's dilemma. The solution to the prisoner's dilemma is only a dilemma if it's a once-off exchange. As soon as you are repeatedly trapped in the prison's dilemma, at that point, cooperation, non-betrayal, becomes the rational strategy. So, if, it's, uh, if I were now to move from a historical understanding of conservatism, drawing on the insights of John Ramsden and 
others, and looking forward to where our conservatism is heading in the future. I'm confident that it's liberal conservatism. And um, whilst I think it was um, in one of those advertisements for BT, was it Maureen Lippmann, who was on the phone to her niece or someone, and the niece is telling her what GCSEs she's got. And at one point, Maureen Lippmann says, oh, you've got an ology then. And although conservatives have been historically rather wary of some of those ologies, I think in the decades ahead, some of those new ologies are going to confirm insights deep in the conservative tradition. Thank you very much indeed. suggested the title and appetite to a power for John. <laughs> so you mustn't blame him, you must blame me. It came to me at Didgit Station one January, but maybe that uh, accounts for its inadequacy. Now, who'd like to start? Could people identify themselves as well for David's benefit and uh, everybody else's? Oh, yes, right at the front. John Rendell needs no introduction. <laughs> um, looking back at the history of the Conservative Party, would you say it's fair that to, to describe a, a something that's happened several times, which is that you absorb the leadership of the Liberal Party uh, and uh, suck all that's, uh, that's useful out of it uh, before spitting out the... Uh, <laughs> are we uh, Chatham House, are you on the record? Uh, I, think I'm, uh, I think I'm on the record. Go on. Go on. <laughs> the, uh, it is certainly true that in the past century there have been several times when Conservatives have governed in various alliances or coalitions with Liberals. And, uh, uh, and they've ended in various ways. Uh, and I'm sure that this time it's absolutely clear that at the next election the Liberals will fight as a distinctive political party. Uh, I hope we'll have, be, have a shared pride in our record in government, but with, I think, their own distinctive manifesto for the next election. I think the point that I would make, back to you John, is what that historic experience of Conservatives and Liberals working together shows is that this sort of Roy Jenkins belief that there is a sort of progressive alliance in British politics, and it's the natural alliance in British politics, but it just gets frustrated because we don't have the right electoral system, whatever, is a misreading of, of British politics. So there are many occasions when Conservatives and Liberals have been able to get and the shared agenda has been essentially a belief in freedom. And uh, indeed, as I think I, I wrote this in a piece in the Telegraph the other day, the, if you look at the two manifestos which we wrote separately in the run up to the last election, there is quite a significant overlap in areas like getting rid of ID cards, excessive criminalising of behaviour, uh, the need for deregulation. You can find some common themes which are that shared belief in freedom, and that's an area that something that enables us to work together. Daniel, uh, Daniel Johnson's standpoint. Um, in the light of this morning's uh, announcement, David, um, wouldn't it really be simpler and more in the spirit of liberal conservatism to simply go for a free market in higher education rather than these immensely complicated? Uh, managed uh, markets that one probably needs two brains to understand. <laughs> <laughs> you wicked boy. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, the, on higher education, yeah. um, you are going to have public finance for students. It can go in different ways, in which in different countries public support is provided. I actually think that our fees and loan system, a development of what we, uh, what they brought in in 2005-06 is a perfectly reasonable way of financing it. But what it does is it tackles the crucial problem, which is, which is a problem in, say, the American system, that, that not every individual can access can, the credit, can raise the funds to finance themselves going to university. Soon as the exchequer is involved, because you are financing higher education somewhere or other, and I think financing it by the student is the right way to do it, but at that point, government inevitably has an interest and a role, not least because there's only a limited amount you can afford. So you end up restricting and controlling the number of students because there's only a certain number of a volume of student loans and student support you can afford. And that's why, and you're right, it's, 
in a rather lively topic today. That's why one of the things that we have been looking at is ways in which in a terminology we can somehow have other, other ways which students should be able to go to their university off quota without being caught in this system. Can you get extra places off quota? And uh, I made it clear in everything from the Today program this morning to when I uh, was answering a question about this in the Commons this afternoon that there are two areas where which we believe we can make progress on off quota students who aren't a claim on the exchequer. Uh, first, when they're sponsored by employers, and secondly, if they're sponsored by charities or other social enterprises. But you you get into all that because you have control over student numbers, and you have control over student numbers because you have public finance going to higher education, and you have public finance going to higher education because not every individual could pay for it themselves. And those, I think, are all perfectly reasonable, logical steps. Yes, up there. Yes, please. Um, how do those two um, uh, principles that you outlined for us in your understanding of liberal conservatism help you explain to us the concept of the big society? Uh -huh. Well, uh, I, see the, I see the big society as a way of um, celebrating the institutions that I was talking about, that's absolutely where they fit in, and it's what, what I was, what I called ages ago civic conservatism. It is a, it is those institutions that stand between the individual and the state. The family is one, but not just that. And the, uh, it's a belief that the growth of the state, which um, the Conservative Party for a long time post-war saw as just an economic threat, can also um, erode civic bonds as well by weakening or displacing them. Uh, and one final comment, I, I can't remember if this is somewhere I've um, learned this, it might well again have been from reading John, but when those conservatives that I quoted in the late 40s and 50s, 60s were talking about the free market, which was the, the main sort of explicit message of conservatism throughout the post-war period, but it didn't suddenly appear in 1979. When they were talking about the free market, they came from a social structure in which they were justices of the peace. They had been officers in the army in the war, where, as the great principle was, um, the officer always eats after the men. They had, they had, they um, had, uh, Quite possibly, sorry to be so traditionist, this is very retro, I'm describing historical circumstances, I'm not recommending them for today. They might well be men with leaving a wife in the constituency who was engaged in sponsoring and uh, patronising a whole host of local groups and charities. So in other words, although the free market bit was the explicit bit, the other part of conservatism was embodied in the backgrounds and values of the people transmitting that message. And I think part of what happened to our party was that when, if you, when those social, when social changes happened, so all that kind of social background, that <coughs> baggage that was carried by someone who might have been talking about the, the free market, but, but everybody knew that his family had some discharged obligations to the community in their local parish or village or whatever. They, the, like, the message is different if the personal circumstances of the person delivering it change as society changes around. And so part of what both the big society is about and civic conservatism is about was, tr was for the Conservative Party to be more explicit about things that were implicit in the way we conducted our lives and the backgrounds of people who were Conservative MPs and didn't have to be explicit. So it's partly bringing out something that was in the character of conservatism that was previously implicit but needed to be talked about more clearly as society changed. Yes. Uh, Matt Ross of Civil Service World. Um, by the time of the election last year, we had quite a, a centrist conservative Leader, if I got a platform. Can you hold the microphone up, Matt? A bit. Is that, that's is that's actually working, right? Yeah. So that's that's better. Better. we had uh, quite a, a centrist uh, conservative leadership, 
um, more so than the, the previous couple of leaderships, and um, a kind of liberal orange book, liberal democrat leadership, again, much more so than the previous couple of leaders. Do you think, how, how important was that kind of the coincidence of that convergence over the previous couple of years to the formation of the coalition? Um, I think that's a very interesting point. I, cert I certainly think that kind of orange book liberalism uh, was um, a very important kind of advance. Yes, I think it was a very, I, I think yours is a very fair point. I would accept that. And um, the, uh, and it does mean that the, as I said, uh, as I said it, it, was, it was a rediscovery of that freedom-oriented strand of, of uh, liberalism. So yeah, I essentially agree with you. Mm. Thank you. Uh, David Ian Beasley from My Lane Group. Um, the, the, the blending of the individual and the belonging has a parallel in the way that cabinets behave. And sort of historically, since the Second World War, anyway, the belonging has tended to dominate over the individual and has expressed itself as collective responsibility. Now, Edmund Dell once said, I think, that in a coalition, you cannot have collective responsibility. And perhaps over the last 12 months there's been evidence to support uh, that view, and particularly in recent periods. Now, in your view, is that true, and does it matter? Uh, I think you can have collective responsibility. And my view is compared, now we're just getting to the, to the anniversary, compared with some of the predictions, um, I think that the um, collective discipline of the Cabinet has held rather well. Of course, people know we're coming at things from different directions. But what I find, the paradox that I find, is that a, it's a, a disagreement with your own, with a colleague, and there are always a disagreement on policy, that surfaces. That's, that is trickier. I mean, it is indeed the case that it's somehow easier if people want to find that Vince has approached some problem or used. To put him away, I wouldn't say, well, he's a member of a different political party. Of course, he sees things rather different than I do. But we're working together, and when we take a decision on policy, we both committed to it, we're bound by it. And, and I was to go around saying, well, I didn't really like that bit of it, but we had to do it. We are, have a shared commitment to the policies we put forward. So I think we can, I think we have been able to make it work. I love your thought of the cabinet government as another example of the individual and the group coming together. It's a very powerful point. But as I say, I, I think it is, it is, uh, it is working, and one of the reasons, of course, and one of the things the Lib Dems decided to do was, although the coalition agreement gave them, uh, you know, it, they, we could have, on higher education, have distanced themselves more, they took a decision, they wanted to, wanted to do this all collectively as a cabinet government, and we didn't. Jeremy. Yes, Jeremy Jennings from the Politics of Parliament. Can I take you back to the, the, the fascinating theme of freedom versus belonging, mm. and, and your response to the party to pursue the response? you gave to the question about the big society. There were several times in both in your talk and then your, your answers now, uh, for example, when you were talking about foregrounding values, which you previously did not have to be foregrounded and so on, when you could have spoken about what Edmund Burke called the spirit of religion. It's quite in interesting that there, you, you talk about the family and you said, and there are other yeah. things too. You could have said the family and religion, but you didn't. You've, it seems to me you, there are several occasions when you could have mentioned the spirit of religion, you have not done. I presume that's not an accident. That is to say, in, sense, in the history of conservatism, Anglicanism has been mm. very, very important yeah. indeed. It received no mention in your talk, you haven't mentioned it now. And I thought that in the big society, the spirit of religion has to have a part. Right. Very, very interesting point. Um, I, I think that one of the ways in which Conservatism has to and inevitably respond to the uh, environment that we're in today is the John Rawls test of public reason, which is that you should formulate arguments which don't require previous shared religious or cultural values to be accepted. You have to put arguments in ways that don't depend, uh, in ways that are persuasive in a more diverse society. And one of the reasons, and this is, I say, a subject for another day, one of the reasons why I have got um, 
interest in the past few years in, as I say, some of these uh, newer disciplines is that they help to naturalise conservative insights. They help you to explain them in ways that don't involve the presumption of a shared uh, religious or cultural understanding. And going even further, I didn't, I didn't come here to talk about my um, book that came out last year, The Pinch, out of your paperback next week. But <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I approached that as the the connection between the generations and obligations between the generations, which is absolutely, of course, in Burke, was I'm tr I was trying to find, trying to get to the kind of core of um, relationships that could be described in ways that were that both meant something to people and didn't require a set of shared religious or cultural values. And my view was that saying, what kind of world are we creating for our children? What obligations are we discharging to our children? Was both had kind of purchase, I genuinely think it's one of the biggest challenges facing our society, and also didn't involve people in having to come to this with a particular set of religious or cultural values. So the book, and I've got one chapter about it in the book, the book is partly, though the word conservatism barely appears in it, it's not written as explicitly a conservative book, but it is implicitly an attempt to write an account of conservatism that works without having to appeal to the, some of the traditional or, or um, eth ethical or religious ties that in the past conservatives could appeal to. Mm -hmm. Peter at the back and then... <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm Peter Cashel and I'm one of uh, a number of people in the room who have the privilege of having been supervised by John Ramsden. And I can remember John back in the 1980s describing himself to me as a cross, uh, crossbow Tory, mm -hmm. by which he said he meant that he was uh, dry on economic issues. You better say what crossbow was. Issues. You might, people might think Ramos was William Tell. I don't know where that places him on the spectrum of Liberal Tories, and I'd be interested in, in knowing whether you think that makes him a Liberal Conservative or not. Um, but it raises the question of how do we see, uh, do we see Liberal Conservatism as adopting particular stances towards economic policy or social policy? Um, and I wasn't clear from your presentation whether you see it as a distinctive trait within the party in which we can see it kind of apostolic succession going back through Macmillan to Noel Skelton or something, um, and indeed whether you see it as a dominant trait, uh, or whether we should be sparing the thought for the uh, Henry Page Cross and Waldron Smithers of the world. Mm. Yeah, well, cross, but Crossbow was the Bow Group's magazine, Progressive Tories, and it started just down the road in Kenneth Baker's flat. In the fifties, that's hence the bow. The crossbow's the match. I don't, I don't, that's fair, didn't I? Um, uh, well, one of the things I didn't get into because it would have been a bit uh, presumptuous was John's own relationship. He said, "Well, we know in uh, towards the end, sadly, he got disenchanted with the Conservative Party, and I think that was part because he felt it was not the Liberal Conservative Party that he believed in. I hope, uh, believe, we can know that." Uh, what happened to the party in the last few years would have won him back. Uh, so I think it is, uh, what I'm describing I think is the mainstream, but it's not always dominant, and there are times when the party does head off in, in different directions. So it's not just sort of circular, true, sort of in a circular kind of way, it's whatever the Conservative Party is doing at the time. I think we do from time to time lose sight of it, but we normally rediscover it. Right at the front. John Stratford. Um, David, you spoke about uh, belonging, uh, and some would say the Conservative Party is tribal, and yet the tribe is diminishing in size. <coughs> Your voters are uh, voting for it. The party's membership has gone from 3 million in 1950 down to 160,000 today. So, who is going to take forward this view of conservatism, uh, or is it going to trans transform into? purely seeking after power? Well, um, we, we have had uh, 
clearly, uh, it's very significant to define as a membership organisation, the I think temporary other political parties as well. And I occasionally have in my constituency some of my activists who say, we ought to go back to having public meetings. We should have a, you should address a, a public meeting and we uh, hire a school hall and I say, yeah, I'll certainly address the manager. I'm not sure how many people will turn up. Well, let's give it a go. And I go and I do a meeting in a school hall somewhere and there's kind of 25 people there and they're all rather depressed and because they, they have a sort of picture of what a lively political meeting should be. I have to say that it's been, leadership contests have been uh, very good with votes for members. Then you do get people are when there are candidates and choices to be made. But I think we just have to accept that forms of joining an association change. And just as in the 19th century, the Conservative Party famously um, got organised and signed people up and indeed learned from some of the techniques of Joe Chamberlain's Liberal Caucus in Birmingham and then brought them across. The, you know, what you, people, you, people follow what the, the blogs, they, uh, they follow uh, things on the web. So I, my view is that the level of communication and contact that people have um, has, uh, is still there. It just takes a different form. And we are certainly, one of the things that we have looked at is also forms of association with the Conservative Party that don't constitute full-blown membership. One thing we've found is that people, if you say to them, will you pay £15 to become a member of the Conservative Party? That's a rather... Uh, big proposition. But if you say uh, your local MP is having meetings or do you want to follow on the web what he or she is saying about policy or would you like to be advised along if we're having a discussion on something or there's a network, do you want to join the network? Suddenly, giving their email address to be on the network, which never appears in the statistics as being a member, that people are very interested in. And uh, I mean, I'm not doing as well at this as some of my colleagues who've got more, more time to vote, but there are constituency MPs who've got thousands of people with whom they are in weekly email contact because they want to join their network for communications and exchanges with them. One last one. Yes, please. Uh, Philip Knight, civil servant. Uh, one issue that you cover in your book, The Pinch, is uh, social mobility and access to professions, particularly the role of education in there. Uh, the stuff you don't mention is internships. I was just wondering, uh, David Cameron's obviously recently been quoted saying he spies what internships friends, children. Uh, quite interested in your opinion on the topic. Well, they are, um, I think they are part of the modern labour market. And what I, I think the question is not trying to kind of uh, ban internships, but to ensure there is. Uh, fair access to them. So what we're trying to focus on uh, constructively as a coalition is um, how you can ensure that for people who don't have the family contacts, or perhaps, for example, as so much, so many of the professions people are looking at are London-based, who don't have a family living in London and for whom accommodation in London is a big challenge, or who need financial support, how they can have a fair crack of the whip on accessing internships. And the House of Commons, I have to say, has done, um, uh, and has been to make some progress on this, where um, there is now, alongside those um, networks of people who become interns, there is a specific social mobility foundation scheme which finances people to come and do internships at the House of Commons when they're coming from outside London, where their family don't have the wherewithal, where they need an income, so as to ensure that. Um, they have the opportunity to do internships as well. So I see it as adding those sorts of opportunities so that it's more equitable is the right way forward. Well, thank you, David. Um, John, we've got drinks over in the foyer. In the, in the foyer, yes. People will guide you. Um, we've had a smashing evening. It's a great start for what is going to be an enduring series in honour of our great friend, John. Thank you very much. Um, I should thank our sponsors, Hewlett Packard. To make the mining group possible. And I should also point out, because uh, casting aside my usual modesty, that David and I are any questions this Friday evening. <laughs> it's at John's College, Cambridge, celebrating its 500th anniversary. Three minutes past eight, Radio 4, don't miss it. <laughs>